So welcome back everyone. Now we're at the last talk of this session. We'll be hearing a talk by Mireille uh, Kibuchi on homological methods in rewriting. Um, she's currently a PhD student at the MIT, advised by Adam Klipala. I hope I didn't mispronounce, I probably mispronounced it. And well, she will be speaking about work she did completely independently, which was awarded by the uh, best paper award for junior researchers at the FSCD conference last year, which is the formal uh, conference on formal structures for computation and deduction. So we're really curious to hear about your work here and please go ahead. Okay, so hello, my name is Mirai and this book, I'm gonna talk about homological methods in rewriting. This talk is about re equational theories or term rewriting systems, TRSs for short. So I begin by clarifying terminology around them. Both equational theories and TRSs consist of a set of variables, a signature, and a set of rules. A signature is a set of constant or function symbols like this, and um, if we fix a set of variables and a signature, we can construct terms looking like this. And then a rule is a pair of two terms. For equational theories, we use an equality sign to represent a pair. And for TRSs, we use an arrow. The only difference between equational theories and TRSs is that if we don't care about the order of two terms, then it's an equational theory. If we do care about the order, then it's a TRS. So let's move on to the main question in this talk. We are given an equational theory or TRS. Then can we tell if there's any smaller theory or TRS to equivalent to the given one? Smaller here means smaller number of rules. So in other words, can we know how many rules are actually needed? This talk will give a lower bound of that number using algebra. Later of this talk, I will explain a brief introduction and history of the algebra we are going to use. Here's an example the theory of groups. The theory of groups is presented by these five axioms, but it's known that these three axioms are enough. They can derive the other two axioms on the right. And even smaller presentations are known. The theory of groups is equivalent to these two axioms. And if you use a symbol for division instead of multiplication, then there's just a single axiom, which is known to be equivalent to the theory of groups. So this is the smallest and in terms of the number of axioms, but do we have a single axiom over the same signature like this one? Like it has multiplication, inverse and identity. So we don't count the last rule as the smallest one since it's over the different signature. It, it doesn't have any information about identity E. So our question is this, is it still possible to give a single axiom equivalent to the theory of groups without changing the signature? Talski, Newman, and Kunin showed the answer is no. Then what about other equational theories or TRSs, not just the theory of groups? If we are given a theory or TRS, can we tell in a generic way how many rules are actually needed? At FSCD 2016, Melvos and Mimran gave a lower bound of the number of rules. Their theorem tells that if we have a complete TRS, complete means terminating and confluent, then you can compute a number MM and any equivalent TRS has at least MM rules. 
the number sign here means the cardinality of a set. But not many TLSs are known to have mn greater than one. So for many examples, the number mn just tells you at least zero or one rule is needed, which is of course trivial. And for equivalent TRS here, the two signatures can be different. So for those reasons, we want another lower bound. Here is my theorem at FSAD uh, 2019. We fix a signature sigma, and let's say R is a complete TRS over sigma. We use a new notion, degree of R, to describe the precondition here, but I'll explain it later. The theorem is, if the degree of R is zero or prime, then we can compute a non-negative integer E of R such that any equivalent TRS over the same signature has at least sharp R minus E of R rules. Equivalence here is the equivalence between two TRSs over the same signature. And this lower bound is greater than or equal to Melbourne's Mimran's lower bound MN. Using this theorem, we can prove Tarski's theorem earlier in a very simple way. Let's say R is a complete TRS of the theory of groups. Computing the degree and E of R, I got the degree is two, which means our theorem is applicable and sharp R minus E of R is two. So we can conclude any TRS equivalent to the theory of groups over the same signature consisting of multiplication, inverse, and identity has at least two rules. And this is the outline of this talk. We are gonna see definitions of degree and E of R first, then example, then a quick overview of my proof. So far, this is the same with my FSAD 2019 talk, but since I have more time today, I'm going to share you about homology, which is the most important thing in the proof. So we begin by the definitions. We define the degree of a tier as first. We assume every variable is written like x sub a natural number for simplicity. Sharp sub i of the term means the number of occurrences of variable xi in the term. The degree of a TRS is defined by doing this. For each rule and for each variable, count the variable in the left term and in the right term. Take the difference of them, then take the GCD of those numbers. For example, let's think about this TRS. For first rewrite rule, x1 occurs once in the both sides, so we get the difference zero. And for x2, it occurs twice in the left side, but doesn't occur in the right side, so we get two. For the second uh, rule, in the same manner, we get three. Taking the GCD of them, we see the degree is one. As a special case, having the degree zero is easily described. The degree of a TRS is zero if and only if the rewrite relation of the TRS preserves the multiset of variables like this example, x1 to x1, x2 to x2, x3 to x2, like that. And to define E of R, we introduce a matrix associated to the TRS which plays a very important role in connecting rewriting systems and algebra. Let's say R is a complete TRS that has N rules and M critical pairs. If you don't know, that's fine. A critical pair is a pair of two terms relating from a single term in two different ways that satisfies some conditions. I don't tell the condition now, but you can find the definition in rewriting textbooks. 
and it's not something I defined. Then uh, we fix a rewriting strategy and D of R, which is I defined, uh, is um, N times M matrix whose IJ's entry is computed using the I's rewrite rule and the J's critical pair. Here is the J's critical pair and we normalize them. And we count the number of I's rewrite rule Li to Ri in each normalizing pad and then take the difference of them. That is the IJ's entry. Here's an example. This DRS preserves variables, so its degree is zero and it has four critical pairs. So D of R is a four, ten, four times four matrix. For the first critical pair, um, the first rewrite rule, A1, appear once in the both side. So we put one minus one, zero here. And A2s appear twice in the left side. So we put two and the other rewrite rule don't appear. So we put zeros. Doing this for the rest, we get the whole matrix. Then we can give E of R, which defines our lower bound. First, we consider the matrix D of R over the integers modulo the degree D. That is, we are going to consider matrix operations over the ring C over DZ. Remember that our main theorem has a precondition, D is zero or prime. If D equals zero, Z over DZ is isomorphic to just Z. And if D is prime, Z over DZ forms a finite field of order D. If D is prime, E of R is defined as the rank of D of R. And if D equals zero, it's something similar to the rank, but a little more complicated. E of R is the number of ones or negative ones in the Smith normal form of D of R. Smith normal form is a normal form of a matrix over Z looking like this, obtained by elementary row and column operations. Uh, the only diagonal elements can be non-zero and each non-zero element divides the element on its lower right. Then let's look at some examples. Um, we already computed the matrix for this example by row and column operations, we can reduce it into this form. E of R is the number of ones or negative ones. So in this case, it's one. Applying the main theorem, we see any TRS equivalent to R has at least three rules. In other words, there's no equivalent TRS with two or less rules and we have an equivalent TLS with three rules, A1, A2, and A3. For the theory of groups, a compu complete TLS has 10 rewrite rules and 48 critical pairs. So we don't compute the matrix here, of course, but I implemented a program to compute the matrix and E of R. I run the program and E of R, that was eight, and which implies any equivalent DRS has at least two rule. So the theory of groups cannot be presented by just one rule over the same signature. My program computes Malvos and Mimram's lower bound also, and it was zero. The last example is a TRS for average and successors of natural numbers. It has one critical pair and D of R is the five times one zero matrix since the left path and the right path paths have the same number of each rule. So E of R is zero. And 
The same E of R is zero means the original TRS R is already one of the smallest. This can be generalized like any TRS whose critical pairs are of this type, then the TRS does not have any smaller TRS, uh, smaller equivalent TRSs. And this type here means the left pairs and the right pairs have the same mod set of rewrite rules. I think it's pretty interesting. I don't know if it's shown by another way, but let me know if you know. Now let's see the proof. From now on, we assume the degree is prime. Assuming D is prime makes the proof simpler because we can use linear algebra. Z over DZ forms a field, not just a ring, and its nth Cartesian power forms an n-dimensional vector space. We also use Melbos Neumann's result even though their lower bound didn't give many interesting examples, their theory behind that is actually important. So we first look into their theory briefly. To define their lower bound, they introduced two linear maps between Z over DZ vector spaces whose dimensions are uh, sharp, uh, uh, sharp uh, I hear echo. I hear echo. Mm -hmm. We do. Is that okay? This yeah. sounds okay. I think it's okay. I, I think that was my fault. Sorry. It's okay. Is it okay now? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So to define their lower bound, they introduced two linear maps. And yeah, uh, the dimensions are sh uh, the number of rules, uh, number of signatures, and critical pairs. And yeah, they are named uh, del1 tilde and del2 tilde. And in fact, we are already familiar with the second map. The matrix D of R we've seen is a matrix presentation of the second map if the TRS is complete. Malbos and Nimlam's lower bound MM of sigma R is defined by the dimension of the quotient space of the kernel of the first map by the image of the second map. Here, the kernel of a linear map is a subspace of the vectors that map to zero and the image is the subspace of the images of all vectors by the linear map. Then mm of sigma r is less than or equal to the cardinality of r. This is shown by abstract linear algebra like the dimension of the quotient space is less than or equal to the dimension of the space we are taking the quotient so we I have kernel and since the kernel is a subspace of z over dz to sharp r, so we have this inequality and it's sharp r. And the core theorem is that their lower bound is invariant under equivalence. Equivalence here is the version where the signatures can be defined. It's shown using homological algebra and the quotient vector space, kernel over image, is called the second homology. By showing MM is invariant under equivalence, we can change R into any equivalent TRS. So um, it means any equivalent TRS has at least MM rewrite rules. This is a very rapid introduction to Marvel's Mimlam's paper. So let's move on to our proof. Um, our lower bound sharp R minus E of R is equal to the dimension of this quotient vector space and we name it V. 
we can show it from some basic facts from linear algebra as well, like the dimension of uh, the quotient space is the difference between the dimensions. And the first term is just sharp r, and the second term is the, the rank of the matrix D of r. And yeah, by definition, it's just E of R. And by also by some theorems for linear algebra, the dimension of V is equal to the sum of the dimension of these two vector spaces, and it's less than or equal to the cardinal V of R. And kernel over image here is the second homology, so it's invariant under equivalence. For the dimension of the image of the one tilde, it does depend on the signature, but it uh, it's invariant between uh, invariant under equivalence between two TRSs over the same signature. In summary, we get these equalities and. Uh, sharp R minus E of R is invariant and uh, equivalence over the same signature. So you can replace R to with any R prime equivalent to R, and then we get the desired inequality. Here, remember the statement of the main theorem. We have a precondition saying the degree of R is zero R prime. And we've seen the case, the degree is prime. The proof can be extended to the case D is zero, but not to the case D is neither zero or prime. Basically, it's because the ring D over DZ is more complicated in that case, especially it has zero divisors, like if D is four, two times two is zero modulo four. And many useful theorems don't work for rings with zero divisors. For such rings, for instance, Smith's normal form used to define the lower bound is not well defined for matrices. Okay, so we saw something called homology in the proof. From now, I wanna talk more about homology and its relation to rewriting. Even before my and Malbos and Mimon's research, homology groups appeared in rewriting in 1980s, so, but for string rewriting. So let's talk about string rewriting. String rewriting systems, SRSs for short, is the same with TRSs, but it's about strings instead of terms. We have an alphabet that is a set of characters and a set of rules. And for instance, we have this kind of SRS here and epsilon is the empty string. And if we have uh, the string ABAB, then we can rewrite BA here to AB. So we get this and ABB is rewritten to epsilon, the empty string. So we get A. For the first step, let's see how string rewriting relates to algebra. There's a relationship between an SRS and a monoid. If we have an SRS, we can define a monoid that is the quotient of the strings over the alphabet by reflexive symmetric transitive closure of the rewrite relation and the multiplication is the string concatenation. In this situation, the SRS is called a presentation of that monoid. For example, let's say our alphabet has just a single character A and a single rule AA to epsilon. Then the monoid has just two distinct equivalence classes, we write brackets for equivalence classes. The class of AA is equal to the, that of epsilon because AA is written to epsilon. For the next example, 
we have two characters AB and rule BA to AB. The, then the monoid looks like this. Since the class of BA equals that of AB by the rewrite rule. And not just we can define a monoid from an SRS. Any equivalent SRS is present isomorphic monoids. And also we are given a monoid. Uh, if we are given a monoid, we can always find an SRS that presents the monoid if we allow to have an infinite alphabet and rules. So this is the relationship between monoids and SRSs. So let's move on to homology groups. What are homology groups? Homology groups appear in many contexts. The most famous one is the homology of a topological space. And this sounds somewhat confusing, but there's something called homology groups of a group. And not just groups, um, Chilen, a field medalist, noticed that we can define homology groups of a general algebraic system. And for any of these, one common thing is that homology groups are abelian groups and they extract some information from the object we are given. Here are examples for topological spaces. We have a sequence, homo a sequence of homology groups for each topological space. And for any two topologically isomorphic spaces, like a sphere and a cuboid, and then the, the sequence are the same. And for, uh, for a sphere, it's known that the zeroth homology is, is the first one, but we count it zeros. The zeroth homology is Z, and the first homology is the trivial group that consisting, consisting of just the identity. And the second is Z, and the letters are all trivial. And for a torus, uh, the first homology is Z times Z, the product of Zs, and the others are the same with the sphere. For surfaces like this, the first homology tells the number of holes. For a sphere, since it has no holes, then the first homology is just, just has zero. And for a torus, we have a hole here, and we can think of the space inside the torus as a hole. So we have two holes. It corresponds to the things that the first homology has two Zs. And for homology groups of groups, I don't give the concrete examples because it's going to be complicated. But basically, there's a sequence of homology groups for each group. And any two isomorphic groups gives the same sequence. And the homology groups of a group, call, also called group homologies, are important to think about homology of a theory or TRS. Similar to monoids, there's something called group presentation. A monoid presentation was a pair of uh, alphabet, uh, sigma, and a set of rules, R. But for a group presentation, R is a set of strings. And strings can have a formal inverse of a character in the alphabet. Then to present a group from the uh, sigma and R, first we create a monoid presentation from them. The new alphabet is sigma with, with its inverse and the rules are W to Y, where W is a string in R or XX inverse or X inverse X for each, R, for each character X. Rules XX inverse Y to Y and X inverse X to Y means the identity rules. So this, uh, this equips the presented monoid with a group structure 
And any group can be presented in this way as well as monoids. And the reason why I'm talking about groups is that group theorists has worked on small presentations of groups for a long time. Since we are interested in small presentations of uh, equational theories or TRSs, that sounds similar. A result by Epstein is that if group G is presented by finite sigma and R, then the difference between the number of rules and the number of characters is bounded below by something using homology groups of G. Uh, S and S is the number of generators and uh, rank is the torsion free rank. If you don't know about them, both S and rank are something similar to the dimension of a vector space, but even though homology groups here are not vector spaces. And if we move the minus sharp sigma to the right hand side, we get a lower bound of the number of rules when we fix the alphabet. So that sounds more similar to our result for TRSs. And indeed, the result for TRSs is the consequence of generalizing this inequality here to TRSs. This is how I reached to the result. But for generalization, we need homology groups for monoids or TRSs. So let's see things about that. For monoids, since monoids are pretty similar to groups, we can construct homology groups for monoids or SRSs in the same way with groups. Also in this case, any two equivalent SRSs or isomorphic monoids give the same homology groups, but not many people had worked on this homology and no application to rewriting were known until 1987. In 1987, Squire, a group theorist, published an amazing paper he solved an open problem at the time. He, the problem asks if there exists monoid with a solvable word problem that cannot be presented by any finite complete SRS. A monoid with a solvable word problem means that checking the equality of elements in the monoid is decidable. And notice that if a com finite complete SRS presents a monoid, the word problem on the monoid must be solvable because if you want to check uh, if two elements are equal, then you can rewrite them by the SRS until they cannot be rewritten anymore. Then you can just check the resulting terms are equal. So the problem is asking if the converse is true or not. What Squire discovered is that if the third homology groups of the third homology group of a complete TRS is not finitely generated, then the SRS must be infinite. His theorem is actually stronger than that, but and remember that if two SRSs are equivalent, then their homology groups are the same. So if we have a complete SRS whose third homology groups is not finitely generated, then not just that SRS is infinite, but all SRSs equivalent to that SRS are infinite. That means we cannot have finiteness and completeness at the same time. This is how he solved the problem. And this was the very first time that homological algebra was applied to rewriting. And I have to mention something about this. I found out about this topic when I was reading the French Wikipedia article on rewriting. The English version doesn't have this. So thank you the French speaker who wrote this article. I published a paper, received an award and was invited here. It's all because of you. So thank you so much, the French speaker. Merci beaucoup. And remember that we saw this diagram here. 
Um, SRSs are closely related to monoids. Now let's see what about TRSs instead of SRSs. Uh, for strings, we can define multiplication as concatenation. Then what about terms? Instead of trying to define multiplication of two terms, we define multiplication of two tuples of terms by substitution. For instance, we have these terms and then their multiplication is substituting the first element of the tuple for x1 in the left term and the second element for x2. Then we get this term. And we can multiply these two tuples. We have a tuple on, even on the left of that uh, in the same way. Uh, the first element for x1 in the left, the second element for x2 in the left, the third element for x3. So if we multiply an n tuple with k kinds of variables and a k tuple with m kinds of variable variables, then we get an n tuple with k kinds of variables. Multiplication uh, and yeah, so to to multiply them, the k's here must co inside. So yeah. Um, and yeah, so multiplication now is defined, but it's not always for, it's not for any two terms. We have something like ter type, something like type, like these two must coincide. So tuples of terms form something like a monoid, but the multiplication is type. What is that algebraic structure called? It's called a category. More precisely, let's see how the category of terms is defined. First, objects are natural numbers. So morphisms are defined between natural numbers. Morphisms from K to N are N tuples with variables X1, X2 to Xk. And Composition is substitution or multiplication. Here, uh, the usual composition, uh, we can see the type matches well, since k on the left is the kinds of variables and k on the right means we have k to pull. And finally, the identity morphism from n to n is the tuple of x1 to xn. This category is the term version of the free monoid or the queen style of an alphabet with multiplication by concatenation. We can generalize that category to something called Lovia theories. A Lovia theory is a category whose objects are natural numbers and each object m equals the nth categorical power of one. The later part means that any morphism from n to k is an antiple of k to 1 to k. And the relationship between TRSs and Lovia theory is pretty much the same with the relationship between SRSs and monoids. Any Lovia theory is presented by a TRS in the, in the, uh, and in the presented Lovia theory, any term t is identified with a term s if and only if t can give s by a sequence of rewriting in either direction. This is how we relate a TRS to an algebraic structure. And I can't give the definition of uh, homology concretely. It's complicated, but uh, for the timeline, homological algebra on Lovia theories is investigated first by Zivolate and Pierce Sibili. They defined cohomology groups of Lovia theories and cohomology groups are something dual to homology groups. And 
Melbos and Neiman defined the homology and figured out the second homology is computable when the given TRS is complete and showed that the number of rules is bounded below by using the homology. And I gave a better lower bound as I talked. In conclusion, um, we get a lower bound of the number of, sorry. Uh, let's see, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, in conclusion, uh, we have a lower bound of the number of uh, rewrite rules to present a TRS of a, a fixed signature. And we saw relationship between rewriting and abstract algebra we have new algebraic tools, and I'm hoping this work gives more research directions of TRSs. So that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a really exciting talk and this nice application of interdisciplinary results. It, well, it shows us that how important open access is in science, as we see in Wikipedia, and that we all should learn French. <laughs> so, are there any open questions? Yeah, I would have a question. Whoops. Uh, okay, continue. Yeah. After you. Uh, just about the, is there a constructive way to get the smaller uh, TRS in your method, or is there an hope to, to build it? Uh, I say I didn't hear you well. Um, is it constructive, constructive the way you you get a smaller uh, system of holes? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. For topological spaces, you mean? From is is your question? You, whether from the lower bound can you extract a constructively a TRS that achieves that lower bound? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we can constructively compute the number. The, the number, but not the, the new the new system of rules from the old one, the smaller yeah. one. Yeah. On, on your implementation, the, does it? Your software does this? I'm sorry? Your, your, your code, you, you, you spoke about your, your code to compute the number, but does your mm -hmm. code also compute the new system, the smallest system? Oh, sorry. Um, we can't compute the system. So it's not, you know, um, it can find a lower bound, but it won't construct the system. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, Rick Statman here. Uh, have you thought of, what I'd like to do is, re instead of using simply the number of occurrences of the variables, I'd like to replace that by an unspecified polynomial depending on that, and then replace uh, the degree with, uh, instead of being prime with an irreducible polynomial. Seems to me everything after that would work just as well. And I'm wondering whether that might get you extend the lower bounds to other possibly powers of primes. I know it's a very vague question, but the, the thing is that the algebra, I think would work equally well on an irreducible polynomial as it would on a, a prime number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what's, what will happen right now, but yeah, thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, I would have a question related to bringing that a little bit closer to lambda calculus. Um, uh, we know, for instance, that there is the S and K combinator calculus and then there is also a single axiomatization of the same with uh, Rosser's X combinator. 
Um, I don't know if uh, your lower bound can tell us if we could search for even simpler um, forms uh, in some of those uh, situations. Uh, uh, the other thing is uh, that um, in intuitionistic propositional logic, uh, which is a bit more complicated than the Boolean one, uh, minimal axiomatizations are known, but I don't think there is a proof that there is one that's minimal. So maybe applying uh, the techniques that you have for some of those could tell us uh, about that. It's more, more of a possible uh, suggestion of uh, uh, to, to reuse the same formalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something interesting. Yeah, so this one applies only to like, uh, the first order term, I think. So it's not, now it's not applicable to, you know, uh, lambda calculus, higher order things. Mm -hmm. so, but, yeah, mm -hmm. but that would be interesting. Have you considered extending this to higher order rewriting systems? I thought about that, but it's not it's not an easy thing. So I'm not sure how to extend. I, I was wondering one thing. Just so the simpler case of linear term rewriting systems, which is a special case of what you're doing. Do you get something, um, I mean, something nice in that, in that case from your, your bound? Mm -hmm. So in your case, yeah, yeah, that might be much simpler. I'm not sure right now, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I had lots of questions. It, it was a very nice talk. One one thing I did, I wanted to ask about uh, the looking at the, the example of monoids, the axiomatization of monoids. I, I mean, like the example that you gave for groups, but uh, can you uh, can you extract a good a lower bound for the axiomatization of uh, of monoids? So like an associative uh, and unital operation. Yeah, I. Yeah, I tried that, but I didn't have any non-trivial inequality, so yeah. Okay. <clears throat> is that known? What is the minimal axiomatization? Like, do you need three um, axioms or? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. Okay. Uh, but yeah, thanks. Thanks again. It was a very nice talk. You're welcome. Perfect. Are there any other questions? Perfect. So thank you very much. It was a really nice talk. So thank you again, Mireille. This ends the first part of this afternoon.